coming up on Network Africa. Aid group at Sansom Frontiers suspends operations in northwest Burkina Faso after the killing of two of its staff members. UN helps 50,000 people return to their home areas in northern Ethiopia's Warhead region of Tigray. Plus, Kenya's ex-interior minister seeks to block detention as police deny surroundings surrounding his home. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Jocker Rogers here in Lagos. Begin today's program in the western part of Kenya, where four miners are trapped in rubble after a gold mine collapsed. The incident in Kakamega County happened in the early hours of today and initially saw 12 artisanal workers trapped for hours. Eight of them were rescued by the morning after several hours of digging by community members, and they are said to be in stable condition. The miners were operating at an aged mining tunnel and were unlicensed by the local government, according to the authorities. Kakamega County Commissioner John Ondego says mining during the night time will no longer be allowed. Incidents of collapsed mines are rampant in parts of Western Kenya. Staying in Kenya, former Interior Minister Fred Matiangi is seeking anticipatory bail, saying he fears he could be arrested and arraigned in court for political reasons. His lawyer filed an application at a high court in the capital, Nairobi, seeking to bar the police from arresting or harassing the former minister. It comes as police denied a reported security operation at the ex-minister's home on Wednesday night. Inspector General of the Police, Jafeth Kume, said the police force had not deployed any officer to the home of the former minister. But Mr. Matiangi's family said that a group of men who declined to identify themselves arrived at their home on Wednesday night and did not explain their mission there. The family says the men took off uh, shortly after the family lawyers and uh, media arrived at the home. The court has not ruled on that request. Let's get more on this. We now speak to Kenyan journalist Brian Wenda. Uh, Brian joins us via Zoom from Nairobi. Hello, Brian. Nice to see you again today. Good to see you too. So you're a journalist on the scene. What's your impression of the goings on around the former minister? Um, well, these are a little bit more Political. It's a political case because uh, first the bro the story broke yesterday at around uh, 9 p.m. when uh, news came in that uh, a few police officers or quote unquote elite police officers did raid the home of the former Interior CS uh, Mat Matiang. However, um, they say that. The media, med the media was the first to respond, uh, and all, also the political class that was uh, behind the Azimio wave, which Matiangi was deep into in the previous elections, was the first to, to respond, giving the political um, the political support because they think that this is a choreographed quote unquote choreographed move by the government to hit back, because he he was a little bit firm on the um, government right now that is in place right now in the previous uh, electioneering period and they think that it's the government hitting back. Now a battery of about 200 lawyers did uh, appear in his house uh, yesterday night to represent the client and also give a statement around the same and uh, it is interesting because they think it's political and they say that uh, these are violation against human uh, rights uh, being a night ar arrest. However, from the other side of it also, the government, which he used to fight in 2022 uh, before the elections, um, they say that this 
is um, a, a well uh, uh, choreographed move by the camp of the CS, of the former CS, to seek public sympathy and also to obtain um, an order so that there might be no arrest on him. And they think this, the whole thing is playing out as politics. And uh, basically, that is what is happening in Kenya right now. But let's look at you know previous events. Have any charges of yes. any sort been brought against him in the past? Um, this is a man who has not been so controversial in the court uh, in the courtrooms. Most was an accused, but. Back in 2019, uh, there is a man called Miguna Miguna. He is a politician and also he's a lawyer. So he was deported in 2018. And in 2019, he moved to uh, take uh, CS Matiangi to court. And he says that he violated his rights because of the illegal, quote unquote, he says illegal deportation. And the courts also said that uh, Miguna Miguna was going to be paid by. Um, was going to be paid by uh, for compensations by uh, CS Matiangi and the other people who are involved in the deportation. And uh, that is the actual case that we can say dates closer and dates way back. This is a man who has been off uh, the courtrooms. So a previous report says opposition leader Raila Odinga and you know a host of politicians observed a vigil outside the ex-minister's home after the alleged stakeout, how likely is such an occurrence? And can you confirm any of this? Um, basically, we have had, I, I even don't remember when we have we had a night arrest, even in the previous administration. Uh, and this is a very unpopular move. And uh, the government has also come very firm, come out very firm and say that fast from coming from this current CS of interior for interior, who says that the government did not send any state agency. These are words that were echoed by um, the IG or Inspector General of Police, and also who says that there was no one from the National Police Service who was sent there. Early in the morning again, we also got news uh, from the EAC or the um, uh, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. They say that still they didn't send their men to to go uh, look for Matiangi. So there was no arrest that was made, and that was something that is, uh, as a fact, there was no arrest that was made. It's just anticipatory, and uh, they're handling it a little bit more politically, however much the, the former CS has moved to court to hinder any arrest. So Ray Lodinga himself is said to have criticized the return to a midnight arrest without charges, mm -hmm. uh, suggesting it's mm -hmm. been done away with. How was it abolished, mm -hmm. and how possible is it that this misunderstanding will be handled in court. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the fact that night arrest was uh, was actually un was deemed unconstitutional in 2012. It's been close to 11 years since this was enacted. And uh, this was after some cases of human violation and also psychological and physical abuse cases, and they say that these were tools of uh, political oppression. Ever since, there has been less uh, drama when it comes to uh, night arrest, of which yesterday, to be very uh, precise, that there was no arrest still that was made, according to what we know. There was no arrest that was made. So it might be, you know, um, they might have tried, to maybe arrest him, or maybe they say from the other political camp, they say this was Matiangi and also his people trying to, um, uh, well, trying to stage something around the same so, so that they can get an anticipatory uh, bail. Right, sir. Ryan, thank you so much for your time today on Network Africa. Thank you. Moving on, Medicine Sun Frontiers, MSF, has suspended its operations in an area of northwest Burkina Faso where armed assailants killed two of its employees on Wednesday. In a statement, MSF said, in part, a clearly marked Doctors Without Borders vehicle carrying a four-person medical team on the road between Dedugu and Trugan was targeted by armed men who fired on the crew.
to Burkina Faso nationals, the driver and the logistics supervisor, aged 39 and 34, were killed. The two victims of Burkina Bay nationality had been employed by MSF since June 2020. MSF President Isabel uh, Defoni uh, says that he is shocked and outraged by this assassination, calling it a deliberate and intentional attack on a clearly identified humanitarian team in the context of its medical mission. This is the second attack perpetrated by suspected jihadists in Burkina Faso after the one that killed six people, three army deputies and three civilians in the center east. Authorities in the Democratic Republic of Congo say the number of people killed during the latest protests against UN peacekeepers has risen to eight, with 28 others injured. The military governor of North Kivu province said the peacekeepers fired in self-defense when protesters attacked their convoy as it was returning to the city of Goma two days ago. Several UN trucks were set on fire and looted. Over the last year, there have been several protests against the UN peacekeeping force, which is widely criticized for failing to stop rebel attacks in eastern DR Congo. And the UN says it has helped 50,000 people return to their home areas in northern Ethiopia's war-hit region of Tigray, three months after a peace deal was signed. About two million people were forced to flee their homes during the two-year conflict. The war created a humanitarian emergency and one academic study last year estimated total civilian deaths caused by the fighting, starvation and lack of health care stood at between 385,000 and 600,000. The head of the UN Refugee Agency, Filippo Grandi, made the announcement at the end of a three-day visit to Ethiopia. Humanitarian access to conflict-affected regions had increased since the deal, but relief efforts still needed to be accelerated as the needs remained very big in northern Ethiopia. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Philip Grandi, also visited Ethiopia to meet with displaced communities. He emphasized the need for long-term solutions and further support for reconstruction and recovery efforts in the face of conflict and climate change, Mr. Grandi also called on the international community to increase their financial commitments to support refugees in Ethiopia, where aid efforts are currently uh, underfunded. This group of people has gone through a lot of suffering. Some have lost relatives, some have lost friends, some have separated families. The peace agreement that was signed in Pretoria and the Nairobi declaration that followed a few months ago have improved the situation considerably. So all this work that has been very difficult during the hostilities is going to be more uh, uh, accessible now. The United Nations released its 2023 humanitarian response plans for Somalia, which seeks 2.6 billion US dollars to assist about 7.6 billion vulnerable people in 2023. Speaking to reporters in New York via video teleconference from Mogadishu, the resident and humanitarian coordinator for Somalia, Adam Abdelmula, said the appeal is being launched at a very difficult time for the country. The UN, the UN released the 2023 Humanitarian Response Plan, HRP, for Somalia, which seeks 2.6 billion US dollars to assist about 7.6 million vulnerable people in 2023. This appeal is being launched at a very difficult time for Somalia. The country is on the brink of famine due to prolonged drought, conflict, high food and water prices, and massive displacement. The drought that is currently ravaging the country is truly unprecedented. The number of people affected by drought in January 2022 had more than doubled by the end of the year and the number of people displaced by the drought increased 
more than fivefold over this past year. Welcome back. A Chinese-owned private security firm has been closed in Mozambique's port city of Beira for alleged involvement in money laundering. The Attorney General's office accuses the owner of Panda Security, Jie Zul, of defrauding the state of about $13 million through tax evasion. Another of his firms, the Tian High Petrol Station, was closed by the authorities two months ago, also on allegations of money laundering. The PGR also suspects him of financing terrorism, forging documents, conspiracy and environmental crimes. Mr. G.A. has not commented on the allegations. In response to the latest closure, more than 3,000 of Panda security workers demonstrated demanding two months of pay, back pay, but their employers' current whereabouts are unknown. Now, Algeria, Egypt, and Tunisia are among the African Union countries that have sent aid and technical assistance to the Turkish-Syrian border. Kenya has committed to sending aid and is calling on trained medical workers to volunteer their services. Africa's largest non-governmental organization, humanitarian organization, Gift of the Givers, has also dispatched teams of rescue workers and equipment to help the huge international rescue efforts. More than 16,000 people in southern Turkey and northern Syria have been killed in the 7.8 magnitude quake and many more are injured. South Africans will be glued to all media platforms tonight as President Cyril Ramaphosa delivers the much-awaited State of the Nation address in Cape Town. What's to be done about rolling blackouts, high crime rates, very high unemployment figures, and anti-constitutional conduct in high places are just some of the issues many citizens want to hear about. In our next report, we look at the people's expectations from the president beyond the pomp and ceremony surrounding the State of the Nation address. All eyes are on Cape Town City Hall for the 2023 State of the Nation address by President Sir Ramaphosa, a most anticipated speech. Civil society groupings have threatened or have promised protests over what they call government's failings, and the economic freedom fighters, as usual, have threatened to disrupt that speech over the Parapara farm theft scandal. But the principal officers of the National Assembly say all is set for the President's speech. We have taken note of planned marches, protests on the day of the State of the Nation address, peaceful process, protests are a feature of our constitutional democracy. We can certainly state that it is all systems go for 2023 State of the Nation address. On the 9th of February, there have even been a few speeches ahead of this day titled The True State of the Nation Address. This is a country that is losing hundreds of billions of rand every single year in productivity and hundreds of thousands of jobs to an ANC-made crisis. Protests over social economic challenges are a dozen a day in South Africa and we stumbled on one of such. We dare to ask what they expect from the president's speech. Uh, I don't want to talk about the sonar because it will be the repeat. He's going to repeat, he's going to lie to the nation. So we know that he's not going to address, you know, our issues, you know. Whatever that is going to address, it, 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 is going, it is something which is going to favor somebody elsewhere, not us. We have written to the president that he must start implementing the state of emergency when it comes to the question of drugs. If Ramaphosa could focus on our kids, on fixing on, on the future of tomorrow, I understand that we also have to fix the present right now. Apart from the various scandals dogging President Ramaphosa and his government, a lot has been said about South Africa's failing state-owned enterprises like ESCOM and the energy crisis. High unemployment and inflation figures, crime rate is very high, as is the poverty level. Experts are asking for a tangible plan. Short term, medium term, uh, long term kind of you know, plan that includes relevant strategies in each category. Dealing, for instance, with corruption. In other words, 
in the short term, what is the government going to do to deal with corruption? In fact, what are the low-hanging fruits that the government could, should do? The low-hanging fruits, you know, uh, if you ask me, could be the names of those people who were clearly fingered by the Zondo Commission and whom the NPA needs to follow, the National Prosecuting Agency and all the security crime-busting organizations of the country. They need to follow those people, make sure that they appear before the courts and that, uh, you know, justice uh, is not only done, but it seems to be done in terms of those people. We don't have a shortage of plans. What we have is a shortage and a lack of political will to implement and to hold those that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing to account. But what has the president done right since he got into office in 2018? We have massive inequalities in this country. We have people who are so rich and people who are barely surviving. And I think that, you know, if you ask me what has he achieved, apart from throwing out empty promises, I would honestly say that the president has not achieved much. Overall, we believe that uh, ever since he took over, from that volatile period of Jacob Zuma. At least he has managed to stabilize the country, he has given the country confidence, the international economy, the international markets, and the international you know, um, uh, community. With Ramaphosa at the helm, he's a little bit happy, you know, uh, or content, one should say, satisfied with somebody like uh, Cyril Ramaphosa being at the helm. Many hope to watch the president's speech live, rolling blackouts allowing. But beyond that speech, they will also be looking to see him walk his talk as he selects his team in an expected appointment of a new deputy president as well as a cabinet reshuffle in the next few days. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. Now we're headed to Malawi where a high court has rejected a bid by the government to uphold the suspension of the head of the anti-corruption bureau, Martha Chizuma. Ms. Chizuma was inter, interdicted on grounds, on, indicted on grounds that she was facing criminal charges whereby she is accused of defaming some high-ranking government officials. The alleged defamatory remarks are contained in a secretly recorded private conversation that she had with a person not employed by her office. Uh, the recording, she purportedly accused some top officials in government and courts of frustrating the fight against corruption. President Harvard said he would not sack her because he considered the recording and its circulation to be corruption fighting back. Uh, the US and the UK, two of Malawi's main donors, expressed deep concerns with the government's actions, which they said undermined the credibility of the country's fight against corruption. Ms. Chizuma is seen as a committed anti-corruption crusader. She has so far indicted the country's vice president, Solus Chilima, and several other high-profile individuals over corruption and has hinted there will be even more arrests. The vice president has denied any wrongdoing. And finally, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has visited Mauritania holding talks with his colleague Salem Mazurg and President Mohamed Uld Ghazani. The two sides discussed bilateral cooperation across a wide range of areas as well as regional and international issues. At a press conference after talks with the Mauritania's Foreign Minister, Mohamed Salem Uld Mazurg, Mr. Lavrov said, Mauritania is interested in supplies of hydrocarbon fuel, food and fertilizers from Russia. It's the first visit of the Russian foreign minister to Mauritania during the 60 years of diplomatic relations. Mr. Lavrov traveled to Sudan later the same day. To wrap on Network Africa, thank you for watching. I'm Jockey Rogers.